Edgar Poe was born in Boston, Massachusetts on January 19, 1809. He was the second child of English-born actress Elizabeth Arnold Hopkins Poe and actor David Poe Jr. He had an elder brother named William Henry Leonard Poe and a younger sister named Rosalie Poe. His father abandoned the family in 1810 and his mother died a year later of consumption or tuberculosis. Poe was then taken into the home of John Allen, a successful merchant in Richmond, Virginia, who sold a variety of goods from cloth, wheat, tombstones, tobacco, and slaves. That's great. The Allens served as a foster family and gave him the name Edgar Allen Poe, though they never formally adopted him. The Allen family had Edgar baptized into the Epsil Copsil Church in 1812. John Allen alternately spoiled and aggressively disciplined his foster son. The family sailed to the United Kingdom in 1815, where Edgar uh, attended the grammar school for a short period in Irvine, North Ayrshire, Ayrshire, Scotland, before rejoining the family in London in 1816. There, he studied at a boarding school in Chelsea until summer of 1817. He was subsequently entered at the Reverend John Bansby's Manor House School at Stoke Newington, then a suburb about four miles north of London. Edgar moved back with the Allens to Richmond in 1820. In 1824, he served as the Lieutenant of the Richmond Youth Honor Guard as the city celebrated the visit of the Marquis de Lafayette. In March of 1825, Allen's uncle and business benefactor, William Galt, died, who was said to be one of the wealthiest men in Richmond, leaving Allen several acres of real estate. The inheritance was estimated to be $750,000, which today would be over $18 million. Nice. By summer of 1825, Allen celebrated his expansive wealth by purchasing a two-story brick house called Moldavia. Edgar may have become engaged to Sarah Elmira, Royster before he registered at the University of Virginia in February of 1826 to study ancient and modern languages. The university was in its infancy established on the ideals of its founder, Thomas Jefferson. It had strict rules against gambling, horses, guns, tobacco, alcohol, all the bad stuff, but these rules were not really uh, enforced. They were completely ignored. <laughs> Jefferson had enacted a system of student self-government, allowing students to choose their own studies, make their own arrangements for boarding, and report all wrong wrongdoing to the facility. So all on the students rather than the faculty, which, uh, since this is a new idea, wasn't really, like, doing very well. <laughs> the unique system was still in chaos, and there was a high dropout rate. During his time there, Edgar lost touch with Sarah and became estranged from his foster father over gambling debts. He claimed that Alan had not given him sufficient money to register for classes, but he had a gambling problem, so that's probably a lie. Edgar gave up on the university after a year, but did not feel welcome returning to Richmond, especially when he learned that his sweetheart, Sarah, had married someone else. He traveled to Boston in April of 1827, sustaining himself with odd jobs as a clerk and newspaper writer and he started using the pseudonym Henry Lee Rennett during this period. Edgar was unable to sustain himself, so he enlisted in the United States Army as a private on May 27, 1827, using the name Edgar A. Perry. He claimed that he was 22 years old, even though he was only 18. He first served at Fort Independence in Boston Harbor for $5 a month, that same year, he released his first book, a 40-page collection of poetry titled Tamburlaine and Other Poems, attributed with the byline by a Bostonian. Only 50 copies were printed, and the book received virtually no attention. <laughs> Edgar's regiment was posted to Fort Moultrie in Charleston, South Carolina, and traveled by ship on the brig Waltham on November 8, 1827. Edgar was promoted to artificer and enlisted tradesmen who prepared shells for artillery and had his monthly pay doubled. He served for two years and attained the rank of sergeant major for artillery, the highest rank that a non-commissioned officer can achieve. He then sought to end his five-year enlistment early. Edgar revealed his real name and his circumstances to his commanding officer, Lieutenant Howard, who would only allow Edgar to be discharged if he reconciled with Allen. 
Edgar wrote a letter to Alan, who was unsympathetic and spent several months ignoring Edgar. Alan may not have written Edgar even to make him aware that his stepmother, stepmother, was dying. <laughs> Francis Allen died on February 28, 1829, and Edgar visited the day after her burial. Perhaps softened by his wife's death, Allen agreed to support Edgar's attempt to be discharged in order to receive an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. Edgar was finally discharged on April 15, 1829, after securing a replacement to finish his enlisted term for him. Before entering West Point, he moved back to Baltimore for a time to stay with his widowed aunt, Maria Clem, her daughter, Virginia Eliza Clem, Poe's first cousin, his brother Henry, and his invalid grandmother, Elizabeth Carnes Poe. In September of that year, Poe received the very first words of encouragement I ever remember to have heard. In a review of his poetry by influential critic John Neal, prompting Edgar to dedicate one of the poems to Neal in his second book, Al Araf, Tamerlane, and Minor Poems, published in Baltimore in 1829. Edgar traveled to West Point and matriculated as a cadet on July 1st, 1830. In October of 1830, Edgar married his second wife, Louisa Patterson. The marriage and bitter quarrels with Edgar over the children born to Alan out of extramarital affairs led to the foster father disowning Edgar. Edgar decided to leave West Point by purposely getting court-martialed. <laughs> On February 8, 1831, he was tried for gross neglect of duty and disobedience of orders for refusing to attend formations, classes, or church. He tactfully pleaded not guilty to induce dismissal, knowing that he would be found guilty. <laughs> Edgar left for New York in February of 1831 and released a third volume of poems simply titled Poems. <laughs> The book was financed with help from his fellow cadets at West Point, many of whom donated 75 cents to the cause, raising a total of $170. It was printed by Alain Bliss of New York, labeled as second edition, and including a page saying, To the U.S. Corps of Cadets, this volume is respectfully dedicated. The book once again reprinted the long poems Tamberlin and Al Araf, but also six previously unpublished poems, including early versions of To Helen, Israfel, and The City in the Sea. Edgar returned to Baltimore to his aunt, brother, and cousin in March of 1831. His elder brother Henry had been ill in health, in part due to problems with alcoholism, and he died on August 1st, 1831. After his brother's death, Edgar began more earnest attempts to start his career as a writer, but he chose a difficult time in American publishing to do so. He was one of the first Americans to live by writing alone and was hampered by the lack of an international copyright law because this is early America. They don't really got that stuff. American publishers often produced unauthorized copies of British works rather than paying for new work by Americans. The industry was also particularly hurt by the Panic of 1837. There was a booming growth in American periodicals around this time, fueled in part by new technology, but many did not last beyond a few issues. Publishers often refused to pay their writers or paid them much later than they promised. And Edgar repeatedly resorted to humiliating pleas for money and other assistance. After his early attempts at poetry, Edgar had turned his attention to prose, likely based on John Neal's critiques in the Yankee magazine. He placed a few stories with a Philadelphia publication and began work on his only drama, Pol Politian. The Baltimore Saturday Visitor awarded him a prize in October of 1833 for his short story, M.S. Found in a Bottle. The story brought him to the attention of John P. Kennedy, a Baltimorean of considerable means who helped Edgar place some of his stories and introduced him to Thomas W. White, editor of the Southern Literary Messenger in Richmond. Edgar became assistant editor of the periodical in August of 1835. But he was discharged a few weeks later because he was drunk on the job. Edgar returned to Baltimore, where he obtained a license to marry his first cousin, Virginia, on September 22, 1835. He was 26 and she was 13. The past was the worst. The past was the worst. Edgar was reinstated by White after promising good behavior, and he went back to Richmond with Virginia and her mother. He remained at the Messenger until January of 1837. During this time, Edgar claimed that its circulation increased from 700 to 3,500. He published several poems, book reviews, critiques, and stories in the paper. 
On May 16, 1836, he and Virginia held a Presbyterian wedding ceremony performed by Amasa Converse at their Richmond boarding house, with a witness falsely attesting Clem's age as 21. Not true. Not true. No. Edgar's novel, The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket, was published and widely received in 1838. In the summer of 1839, Edgar became assistant editor of Burton's Gentleman's Magazine. He published numerous articles, stories, and reviews, enhancing his reputation as a trendant critic which he had established at The Messenger. Also in 1839, the collection Tales of the Grotesque and Aberesque was published in two volumes, though he made little money from it and received mixed reviews. In June of 1840, Edgar published a prospectus announcing his intentions to start his own journal called The Stylus. Although he originally intended to call it The Pen, as it would have been based in Philadelphia, he bought advertising space for his prospectus in June of 1840. Issue of Philadelphia's Saturday Evening Post. Prospectus of the Pen Magazine, a monthly literary journal to be edited and published in the city of Philadelphia by Edgar A. Poe. Edgar left Burton's after about a year and found a position as writer and co-editor at the then very successful monthly Graham's Magazine. In the last number of Graham's for 1841, Edgar was among the co-signatories to an editorial note of celebration of the tremendous success that the magazine had achieved in the last year. Perhaps the editors of no magazine, either in America or in Europe, ever sat down at the close of a year to contemplate the progress of their work with more satisfaction than we do now. Our success has been unexampled, almost incredible. We may assert without fear of contradiction that no periodical ever witnessed the same increase during so short a period. Around this time, Edgar attempted to secure a position within the administration of President John Tyler, claiming that he was a member of the Whig Party. He hoped to be appointed to the United States Custom House in Philadelphia with help from President Tyler's son, Robert, an acquaintance of Edgar's friend, Frederick Thomas. Edgar failed to show up to the meeting with Thomas to discuss the appointment in mid-September of 1842, claiming to have been sick, though Thomas believed that he may have been drunk. Edgar was promised an appointment, but all positions were filled by others. One evening in January of 1842, Virginia showed the first signs of tuberculosis while singing and playing the piano, which Edgar described as breaking a blood vessel in her throat. She only partially recovered, and Edgar began to drink more heavily under the stress of her illness. He left Graham's and attempted to find a new position for a time angling for a government post. He returned to New York, where he worked briefly at the Evening Mirror before becoming the editor of the Broadway Journal, and later its owner. On January 29, 1845, the poem The Raven appeared in the Evening Mirror and became a popular sensation. It, was, it made Edgar a household name almost instantly, though he was only paid $9 for its publication. It was concurrently published in the American Review, a Whig journal, under the pseudonym Quarles. The Broadway Journal failed in 1846, and Edgar moved to a cottage in the Fordham, New York, in the Bronx. Virginia died at the cottage on January 30th, 1847. Biographers and critics often suggest that Edgar's frequent theme of the death of a beautiful woman stems from his repeated loss of the woman in his life. Edgar was increasingly unstable after his wife's death. He attempted to court poet Sarah Helen Whitman, who lived in Providence, Rhode Island. Their engagement failed, purportedly because he was drinking and he was erratic. There's also strong evidence that Whitman's mother intervened and did much to derail the relationship. Just like, ha no. <laughs> Edgar then returned to Richmond and resumed a relationship with his childhood sweetheart, Sarah Elmira Royster. You know the chick who got married to someone else? Yeah. Nice. This is when everything goes downhill. On September 27th, 1849. Edgar left Richmond, Virginia, on his way home to New York City. No reliable evidence exists about his whereabouts until a week later, on October 3rd, when he was found delirious in Baltimore at Ryan's Tavern, sometimes referred to as Gunner's Hall. A printer named Joseph W. Walker sent a letter requesting help to Joseph E. Snodgrass, an acquaintance of Edgar. His letter reads as follows. Dear Sir, there is a gentleman, rather the worse for wear, at Ryan's fourth ward polls, who does under the 
cognomen of Edgar A. Poe, and who appears in great distress, and he says he is acquainted with you, and I assure you, he is in need of immediate assistance. Yours in haste, Joss W. Walker. Snodgrass's first-hand account describes Edgar's appearance as repulsive, with unkempt hair, a haggard, unwashed face, and a lustrous and vacant eyes. His clothing, Snodgrass said, which included a dirty shirt but no vest and unpolished shoes, was worn and did not fit him well. So he looks like a hobo. <laughs> John Joseph Moran, who was Edgar's attending physician, gives his own detailed account of Edgar's appearance. A stained, faded, old brosmane coat, pantaloons of a similar character, a pair of worn-out shoes run down at the heels, and an old straw hat. Edgar was never coherent long enough to explain how he came to be this way and why he looked like that, and is believed that the clothes weren't even his because he was never known to wear clothes that didn't fit. So it was weird that he was wearing dirty clothes, he was unkept. People don't think the clothes were his. Moran cared for Edgar at Washington College Hospital on Broadway and Fayette Street. He was denied any visitors and was confined in a prison-like room with barred windows in a section of the building dedicated to drunk people, which I didn't know was the thing. They had a drunk section. <laughs> Edgar is said to have repeatedly called out the name Reynolds on the night before his death, though no one has ever been able to determine who he was talking about. <laughs> one possibility is that he was recalling an encounter with Jeremiah and Reynolds, a newspaper editor and explorer who may have inspired the novel of the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. Another possibility is Henry R. Reynolds, one of the judges overseeing the Fourth Ward polls at Ryan's Tavern, who may have met Edgar on election day. Edgar may have instead been calling out for Herring, as the author had an uncle-in-law in Baltimore named Henry Herring. In later testimonies, Moran avoided reference to Reynolds, but mentioned a visit by a Mrs. Herring. He also claimed that he attempted to cheer up Edgar during one of his few times he was awake. When Moran told his patient that he would soon be enjoying the company of friends, Edgar allegedly replied that the best thing his friend could do would be to blow out his brains with a pistol. He's doing well. In Edgar's distressed state, he made reference to a wife in Ver Richmond. He may have been delusional, thinking that his wife Virginia was still alive, or he may have been referring to Sarah, to whom he had recently proposed. He did not know what happened to his trunk of belongings, which, it transpired, had been left at the Swan Tavern in Richmond. Moran reported that Edgar's final words were, Lord, help my poor soul, before dying on October 7th, 1849. Because Edgar did not have any visitors, Moran was the only person to see, his, see him in his last few days. Even so, his credibility has been questioned repeatedly, if not considered altogether untrustworthy. Throughout the years after Edgar's death, his story changed as he wrote and lectured on the topic. He claimed in 1875 and again in 1885 that he had immediately contacted Edgar's aunt and mother-in-law, Maria Clem, to let her know about Edgar's death. In fact, he wrote to her only after she had requested it on November 9th, after a full month after the event. He also claimed that Edgar had said quite poetically as he prepared to draw his last breath, The arched heavens encompass me, and God has his decree legibly written upon the frontals of every created human being, and demons incarnate, their goal will be the seething waves of blank despair. The editor of the New York Herald, which published his version of Moran's story, admitted that they do not believe Edgar would have said something like that, because if he was as delirious as Moran originally stated, it's highly unlikely that he would wake up and be cognizant enough to say something that deep. <laughs> Moran's accounts even altered dates. At different points, he claimed Edgar was brought to the hospital on October 3rd at 5 p.m., October 6th at 9, p 9 a.m., or on October 7th, the day he died, at 10 p.m. For each published account, he claimed to have the hospital records as reference. A search for hospital records a century later came up with nothing. There are no records of Edgar being there, and there isn't even a death certificate. There's literally nothing. Some critics say Moran's inconsistencies were because he was getting old. It wasn't because he was lying just to get attention. It was because he was being innocent, and he wasn't. Re he didn't really know what he was. He was getting old. Um, at the time he wrote his last account, it was 1885, and he was in his 60s. All medical records and documents, including his death certificate, are lost, if they ever existed at all. 
The precise cause of Edgar's death is disputed, but many theories exist. Many biographers have addressed the issue and reached different conclusions, ranging from Jeffrey Meyer's assertion that it was hypoglycemia to John Evangelist Walsh's conspiratorial murder plot. <laughs> It has also been suggested that Edgar's death might have been resulted from suicide related to depression. In 1848, he nearly died from an overdose of landium, readily available as a tranquilizer and painkiller, though it is unclear if this was a true suicide attempt or a miscalculation. In 2020, a psychological analysis of Edgar's language theorized that he was suffering from a major depressive episode near the end of his life, and that suicide could not be ruled out. However, the evidence for suicide was not consistently present in Edgar's professional writings, leading the researchers to conclude that depression may have played a role in his death, but suicide was unlikely. Snodgrass was convinced that Edgar died from alcoholism and did a great deal to popularize the idea. He was a supporter of the temperance movement and found Edgar a perfect example in, the tem in his temperance work. However, Snodgrass's writings on the topic have been proven untrustworthy. Moran contradicted Snodgrass by stating in his own 1885 account that Edgar did not die under the effect of an intoxicant. Moran claimed that Poe did not have the slightest odor of liquor on his breath or person. Even so, some newspapers at the time reported Edgar's death as congestion of the brain or cerebral inflammation, euphemisms for deaths caused by alcoholism. Edgar's characterization as an uncontrollable alcoholic is disputed. His drinking companion for a time, Thomas Maine Reed, admitted that the two engaged in wild frolics, but that Edgar never went beyond the innocent mirth in which we all indulge. While acknowledging this as one of Poe's failings, I can speak truly of its not being habitable. Some people believe that Edgar had a high susceptibility to alcohol and became drunk after one glass of wine. He only drank during difficult periods of his life and sometimes went several months at a time without drinking. Adding further confusion about the frequency of Edgar's use of alcohol was his membership in the Sons of Temperance at the time of his death, which would be kind of weird if you're part of a group that doesn't believe in drinking alcohol and then you die because of alcohol. It's possible, but kind of weird, don't you think? William Glenn, who administered Edgar's pledge, wrote years later that the temperance community had no reason to believe that Edgar had violated his pledge while in Richmond. Suggestions of a drug overdose have also been proven to be untrue, though it is still often reported. Thomas Dunn English, an admitted enemy of Edgar and a trained physician, insisted that Edgar was not a drug user. Had Poe the opium habit when I knew him before 1846, I should both as a physician and a man of observation have discovered it during his frequent visits to my rooms, my visits at his house, and our meetings elsewhere. I saw no signs of it and believed the charge to be a baseless slander. Numerous other causes of death have been proposed over the years, including several forms of rare brain disease or a brain tumor, diabetes, various types of enzyme deficiency, syphilis, apoplexy, delirium tremens, epilepsy, and mangal inflammation. A doctor named John W. Francis examined Edgar in May of 1848 and believed he had heart disease, which Edgar later denied. A 2006 test of a sample of Edgar's hair provides evidence against the possibility of lead poisoning, mercury poisoning, and similar toxic heavy metal exposures. Cholera has also been suggested. Uh, Edgar had passed through Philadelphia in early 1849 during a cholera epidemic. He got sick during his time in the city and wrote a letter to his aunt, Maria Clem, saying that he may have had the cholera or spasms quite as bad. Because Edgar was found on the day of an election, it was suggested as early as 1872 that he was the victim of cooping. This was a ballot box stuffing scam in which victims were abducted off the street by local election gangs, imprisoned in a small room called the coop, drugged and or forced with alcohol to get them to comply or face beatings. The cooping victims were used as pawns to vote for a political party at multiple locations. Often their clothing would be changed to fool voting officials and vote multiple times and or they would be given disguises such as wigs, fake beards, or mustaches. Cooping had become the standard explanation for Edgar's death and most of his biographies for several decades 
which would also explain the dirty and disheveled clothes he was wearing that many don't think were even his. Though his status in Baltimore and may have made him too recognizable for something like this to work. Most recently, analysis has been presented suggesting that Edgar's death resulted from rabies, possibly contracted from rat bites during his cooping days of captivity. Edgar's funeral was a simple one, held at 4 p.m. on Monday, October 8, 1849, in Baltimore. Few people attended the ceremony. Edgar's uncle, Henry Herring, provided a simple mahogany coffin, and a cousin, Nielsen Poe, supplied the hearse. Moran's wife made his shroud. The funeral was presided over by Reverend W.T.D. Clem, cousin of Poe's wife, Virginia. Also in attendance was Snodgrass, Baltimore lawyer and former University of Virginia classmate, Zacchaeus Collins Lee, Poe's first cousin, Elizabeth Herring, and her husband, and former schoolmaster, Joseph Clark. The entire ceremony lasted three minutes in the cold, damp weather. Reverend Clem decided not to bother with the sermon because the crowd was too small. Sexton, George W. Spence, wrote of the weather. It was a dark and gloomy day, not raining, but just kind of raw and threatening. Edgar was buried at Westminster Presbyterian Churchyard in Baltimore in a cheap coffin that lacked handles, a nameplate, cloth lining, or a cushion for his head. On October 10th, 2009, Edgar received a second funeral in Baltimore. Actors portrayed Edgar's contemporaries and other long-dead writers and artists. Each paid their respects and read eulogies adapted from their writings about Edgar. The funeral included a replica of Edgar's coffin and a wax cadaver. Edgar is buried on the grounds of Westminster Hall and Burying Ground, now part of the University of Maryland School of Law in Baltimore. Even after his death, he created controversy and mystery. Edgar was originally buried without a headstone towards the rear corner of the churchyard near his grandfather, David Poe Sr. A headstone of white Italian marble paid for by Nielsen Poe was destroyed before it reached the grave when a train derailed and plowed through the monument yard where it was being kept. Instead, it was marked with a sandstone block that read number 80. In 1873, Southern poet Paul Ham Hamilton Hayne visited Edgar's grave and published a newspaper article describing its poor condition and suggesting a more appropriate monument. Sarah Sigourney Rice, a Baltimore school teacher, took advantage of renewed interest in Edgar's gravesite and personally solicited for funds. She even had some of her allocution students give public performances to raise money. Many in Baltimore and throughout the U.S. contributed the final 650 came from Philadelphia publisher and th philanthropist George William Childs. The new monument was designed by architect George A. Frederick and built by Colonial Hugh Sisson and included a medallion of P Edgar by artist Aldebert Volk. All three men were from Baltimore. The total cost of the monument with the medallion amounted to slightly more than $1,500 or over $30,000 today. Edgar was reburied on October 1st, 1875, at a new location close to the front of the church. A celebration was held at the dedication of the new tomb on November 17th. His original burial spot was marked with a large stone donated by Oren C. Painter, though it was originally placed in the wrong spot. Attendees included Nielsen Poe, who gave a speech and called his cousin one of the best-hearted men that ever lived as well as Snodgrass, Nathan C. Brooks, and John Hill Hewitt. Though several leading poets were invited to the ceremony, Walt Whitman was the only one to attend. Alfred Tennyson contributed a poem that once denied him, an envy that once decried him, and malice that beliled him, now cenotaph his fame. Probably unknown to the reburial crew, the headstones on all the graves, piercely facing to the east, had been turned to face the west gate in 1864. The crew digging up Edgar's remains had difficulty finding the right body. They first exhumed a 19-year-old Maryland militiaman, Philip Mosher Jr. When they correctly located Edgar, they opened his coffin and a witness noted, The skull was in excellent condition. The shape of the forehead, one of Edgar's striking features, was easily discerned. It's a weird thing to say, but alright. Nice forehead. A few years later, the remains of Edgar's wife, Virginia, were moved to the spot as well. In 1875, the cemetery in which she lay was destroyed, and she had no kin to claim her remains. 
William Gill, an early Poe biographer, gather her bones and store them in a box under his bed. Virginia's remains were buried with her husband's on January 19th, 1885. So he kept them for 10 years. Cool you. The 76th anniversary of her husband's birth and nearly 10 years after his present monument was erected. Spence, the man who served a sexton during Edgar's original burial, as well as his exhumation and reburial, attended the rites that brought his body to rest with Virginia and her mother, Maria Clem. On October 9th, the day after Edgar's burial, an obituary appeared in the New York Tribune signed only Ludwig. The obituary floridly alternated between praising the dead author's abilities and eloquence and damning his temperament and ambition. Ludwig said that the lit literary art lost one of its most brilliant but erratic stars. Also claimed that Edgar was known for walking the streets in delirium, muttering to himself, and that he was extremely arrogant, assumed all men were villains, and was quick to anger. Ludwig was later revealed to be Rufus Wilmot Griswold, a former colleague and acquaintance of Edgar. Even while Edgar was still alive, Griswold had engaged in character assassination. Much of his characterization in the obituary was lifted almost verbatim from that of the fictitious Francis Vivian in the Caxtons by Edward Bullier Lighton. The obituary quickly became the standard characterization of Edgar. Edgar Allan Poe is dead. He died in Baltimore the day before yesterday. This announcement will startle many, but few will be grieved by it. Walk the streets in madness or melancholy, with lips moving in instinct curses, or with eyes upturned in passionate prayers, never for himself, for he felt, or professed to feel, that he was already damned. That's not very nice. Ya ass! Griswold wrote a biographical article of Edgar called Memoir of the Author, which he included in an 1850 volume of the collected works. There, he depicted Edgar as a deprived, drunken, drug-addicted madman and included Edgar's letters as evidence. Many of his claims were either lies or distortions. For example, it is seriously disputed that Edgar was even taking drugs. Griswold's book was denounced by those who knew Edgar well, including John Neal, who published an article defending Edgar and attacking Griswold as a Radamanthus who is not to be built of his fee, a thimbleful of newspaper notoriety. Griswold's book nevertheless became a popular biographical account of Edgar's life. This was in part because it was the only full biography available and was widely reprinted, and in part because readers thrilled at the thought of reading works by an evil man. Letters that Griswold presented as proof were later revealed to be forgeries. So, was Edgar Allan Poe murdered? Was he cooped? Was he... Was it suicide? Who knows? <laughs> Technically, to this day, this case remains unsolved. To conclude, I don't really know what to think. The main issue is that no one knows how Edgar died. The only real way to do that would be to dig up his corpse and test his bones. Of course, you might not be able to find exactly how he died unless it was a certain type of disease or... And it's been so long that a lot of the evidence is probably gone. But if they tested some of his bones or maybe more hair if they found any and could de determine how exactly he died or if more information comes through to determine what happened between September 27th and October 3rd when he was found, that would be amazing. Because all we know... On September 27th, he was heading home. October 3rd, he was found in Baltimore, all disheveled and wearing clothes that weren't, that didn't fit him correctly. He was dirty. He was mumbling. He was barely conscious. He was not well. Supposedly, he wasn't drunk. A lot of people think he was, but he was in a group about temperance, which is, you know, something you, you don't drink. Um, of course, he could have fallen off the wagon and started drinking. It's quite possible. But if you join a group like that, you're less likely to do shit like that. Honestly, cooping makes a lot of sense. Like, I could totally see that happening, but it's Edgar Allan Poe. So getting away with that might be difficult, but if they had disguises, some people are stupid. So it's possible. But unless they find a letter or someone's distant descendant finds some information in the basement or attic where they're like, holy shit, we're not gonna know. 
Edgar could have died of suicide. He could have died of a heart attack. He could have died from being drunk. He could have died from drugs, which I don't think is likely, but it's possible. He could have died from a number of diseases, cholera being one of them. He could have been cooped. He could have been attacked in the street. You know, we don't know. All we know is that he left for home on September 27th and was found October 3rd, dying four days later. That's all we know. And his life was a hard one. He didn't have the greatest life by any means. And he struggled. He wanted to be a writer. That's what he wanted to do. But back then, being a writer did not pay the bills. <laughs> and he did drink a little much a little more than you probably should. It was one of his downfalls. Now, was alcohol the thing that killed him? I don't know. I don't know. It's possible, but we don't know. Until more information comes out, we don't know if it was suicide, a disease, or maybe murder. Foul play. Comment down below what you guys think. What do you think happened to Edgar Allan Poe? I hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as you can enjoy a story like this. I'll be back again on Thursday with another True Crime Thursday. Monday with whatever I decide to post.